Have you ever filled out uh, an application for something? I'm sure you have at some point. You know, when I was growing up, my parents placed a huge emphasis on going to college. And um, they're hardworking people. My dad worked in construction, uh, kind of worked his way up from, from the bottom uh, and, and into roles of greater responsibility. My mom worked at several different jobs over the years, uh, but their dream for me was that I would go to college and, and be the first one in either side of the family to get a college degree because they, they kind of wanted me to have life a little easier than they did. That was their hope. Um, so, of course, when I got to the end of high school, um, I applied to colleges. I applied for scholarships. You know, years later, I applied for jobs. Um, then at some, along the way, I applied for a mortgage. You know, all those things that we do in life. Um, and, and you know how that goes, right? You fill out a ton of paperwork for those things, a lot of anxious waiting for that letter or that phone call that's going to say whether you're getting it, getting in, or whatever it is. Uh, as we've been studying the, the life of Jesus, that's been our, our study this spring, um, you know, it struck me that you could, could think of Jesus as a kind of application counselor. See, in, in his day, uh, the question on a lot of people's minds was, how do I get into God's kingdom? Well, what is that? What are they talking about? Well, the Old Testament talked about uh, God's kingdom coming as a time when God would, would rule as king over the earth, a time when there would be worldwide peace, uh, a time when, when, there, when hunger and poverty would be eliminated, when sickness and death will cease forever, when people will live forever without all the problems of, of aging as we know it. A time when there's no more suffering, when there's no more sin, when there's no more evil. We sang about it this morning. I mean, doesn't that sound good? All the things that we deal with in life, all this, those struggles, just to kind of put all of that aside and be in the presence of God. That's good. I mean, isn't that what you want for your life? But the question is, how do you get in? How do you apply for that? You know, what test do you have to take? Um, is there an SAT to get into heaven, to get into God's kingdom? Uh, well, Jesus said a lot about, about, the, about getting into the kingdom during his life and ministry, but one of his fullest answers to that question is found in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's, it's recorded for us in both Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. Luke, uh, it's in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 49. In Matthew, he gives us a fuller account. It's, it's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And the Sermon on the Mount contains some of the most profound words ever spoken. Crisp and clear. Simple and yet probing. And they're vivid, picturesque, and yet very, very practical. Even people who reject Christianity can't help but admire the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible message that Jesus preached. And today I'd like to focus on that sermon. We've been doing a survey of the life of Jesus and touching on the kind of the overview of his ministry in conjunction with our Bible reading schedule, our 90-day Bible reading schedule, reading all four Gospels in chronological sequence between New Year's and Easter. I think there may still be a few copies of those left, so if, if you don't have one of those, you could pick one up and jump in with us. Um, and just jump in on, on today's reading and read along. And it's actually in the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we're at in that schedule. So today, rather than just offering another explanation of, of the Sermon uh, on the Mount, I mean, there's, there's tons of those. You could fill dozens of bookshelves with the books that have been written on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I thought it might be better just to preach the Sermon on the Mount just to preach Jesus' words. I mean, you've probably read them multiple times. I have. But I think there's something different about hearing them. Normally when I teach, I encourage you to follow along in your Bible. I encourage you to take notes. Today I, wanna, I, I would encourage you just to set those things aside for, for a few minutes. Now let's just listen to Jesus' sermon. 
imagine yourself for a moment that uh, you're part of the crowd, right? It's on a hillside uh, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And there's, there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of people gathered in that beautiful place. You've heard about the miracles of Jesus. You've heard about some of the things he's done. Healing the sick, casting out demons, cleansing a leper, healing the lame, making them to walk. Everybody's talking about him everywhere. And so you've come to hear him for yourself. To see what he's all about. And you've heard that Jesus is up the hill praying. But then a buzz shoots through the crowd as he begins to come down the mountain. And he comes and he takes his seat, maybe on a rock or a grassy knoll on the hillside, and he begins to speak. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid up the last cent. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oaths at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond these is of evil. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you. Do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your, your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they'll be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they'll be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. The eye, of, the eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon, in all his glory, clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what? What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Do not judge, so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they'll trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you'll know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Those are Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount. Now, he may have said much more than that that day. Um, Luke gives us some, some extra insight into that, some other things that Jesus said. Uh, but Matthew seems, like I said earlier, Matthew has the, the fullest account. So, did you follow Jesus' line of thinking? If you're taking notes, let me try to sum up, just briefly, what we heard in that sermon. To sum it up in one statement, I think Jesus' message was this, to entrust your life to Him. And trust your life to him. And he, he, that comes out in, in seven expressions of that trust. If we walk through the sermon here just briefly. First, it, it comes out in your attitude. Right? That's the, that opening section, those, those great beatitudes. Where Jesus talks about, about the kingdom, about what it's like. That it's... It's, 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 being, it's when the, the hungry, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are satisfied. It's when the, the merciful receive mercy. Right? It's all of those things. And that all begins with this humble heart attitude to be poor in spirit, to be mourning, to be gentle, to be hungering and thirsting, to be merciful, pure, peacemaking, persevering even in the face of persecution. All of those things that Jesus talks about there. It's all about an attitude that says, I'm going to entrust myself to him. Secondly, we entrust ourselves to him in our influence. That's where he talks about the salt and the light. All right? This kind of trust is expressed in good works that have an impact, that they shine forth, they permeate the world, and they, they draw people toward God and his kingdom. We have that kind of influence. Third, entrust your life to Jesus in your morals. In order to enter his kingdom, we need to, to perfectly fulfill God's law. Perfectly, that was his point, right? He, he showed us how all of the commandments are not just a list to check off, but they all point to the perfect character of God. And he says, that's the standard for entering the kingdom. But there's a, this awareness. I mean, even, even in chapter 6 in the prayer, he talks about needing forgiveness, right? We can't be perfect. That's why I think that one of the key statements in, in that sermon is when Jesus says, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We need someone who will fulfill that law for us. We can't measure up to the perfection of God, but He can. And that's what Jesus came to do. He is that person. And because He is, we shouldn't try to water down His standards. We should accept them as they are and seek to obey Him from the heart. Fourth, entrust your life to Jesus in your devotion. Right? When we... We, when we entrust our lives to Him, we give up trying to, to turn our religious acts into a show. 
giving, praying, fasting, all those things are supposed to be part of your private relationship with God. Not something that's shown off. So entrust that all to Him. Let Him be the one who rewards it. Fifth, entrust your life to Jesus in your sustenance, your provision, your survival. When we entrust our lives to Him, then He's the one that we serve, not money. Right? Like He said, you can't serve two masters. And that means trusting Him to provide for all of our needs. That He cares for us. Sixth, and trust your life to Jesus in your relationships. Trusting our, and trusting ourselves to him means giving up trying to control people. Right? Through condescension and judgment. We change ourselves first. And we pray for others. We ask. We seek. We knock with God. And we treat them the way that we want to be treated with that kind of respect. But that all flows from this trust, trusting Christ. And finally, entrust yourself to him in your actions. Right, the narrow path that Jesus talked about is submission to God's will. It's acting on his words. And when we do that, that is that true and good fruit so we're called to build our lives on his words. Not in anything else. Anything else is the shifting sand, right? But the solid rock of the words and the teaching of Jesus. That kind of sums up this sermon for us. It's a powerful, powerful message. So what's your response to it today? And you hear the words of Jesus. Maybe today, as you think about this, maybe the place to start, if, maybe you've never heard all that before. Or maybe, maybe you've heard bits and pieces of the sermon, but never all together. There's something about seeing those all connect into one whole, one message about the kingdom that, that is powerful. Maybe the place to start for you today is to commit to reading that sermon. Take some time, maybe today. It's, it doesn't take long. 15 minutes, maybe. But read through that sermon. Think about it. Chew on it. See who Jesus was. See what this message was that he proclaimed. See what he's talking about. About this kingdom. Maybe you have read it. Maybe you've heard of, of Jesus before. And you come to that place today where you, you know, I said that the main point of this is to entrust your life to him. Maybe you've never done that. Or you've never come to that place where you've kind of drawn a line in the sand. You've made a decisive choice to say, I'm going to trust him now. Not just, okay, I believe that Jesus exists, but to say, okay, I'm going to entrust myself to him. I'm going to entrust my future. I'm going to entrust my present. I'm going to entrust my survival to him. I'm going to make right choices that honor him no matter what happens and have that humble attitude before him. Or maybe you've done that at some point in the past, but your attitude's grown hard. Maybe your response to his sermon today is, is to start back at that attitude. Say, I need to be poor in spirit. I need to be broken and mourn over sin. I need to be gentle. I need to hunger and, and thirst after righteousness. I need to be a peacemaker. I need to be willing to face whatever persecution comes my way. I need to be pure. Or maybe there's a particular issue in your life that you just haven't entrusted to Christ. That you've been holding on to trying to work through in your power, in your own wisdom, your own strength. You need to let it go of it today. Let's take a moment to pray. And I would encourage you to speak 
to the Lord, just personally. 